Hi there, I'm James Frierson, and this is Line Edit, a video series about popular scholarly writing, generously funded by the John Templeton Foundation. Who am I? I'm a newspaper and magazine editor. I've worked in the industry for more than 20 years at a variety of publications. For the past 18 years, I've been at the New York Times, first at the Sunday Magazine, and now at the Opinion Pages. In each episode of this series, Line Edit, I'm going to talk about my experiences editing a specific piece by an academic that I've worked with. These are short pieces written for wide audiences about the big questions. In today's video, we're going to talk about an op-ed written in the New York Times by Kwame Anthony Appiah, a philosophy professor, called What Does It Mean to Look Like Me? The subtitle is Minorities Can Find It Gratifying to See People Who Resemble Them on Screen, But Resemblance is a Tricky Thing. This is a really nice piece by Anthony. As the subtitle indicates, it's a piece about this kind of cultural trope that you hear a lot, where people say that it's really refreshing, particularly if they're a member of a minority group, to look out at the popular culture and see a people on screen or in stories who in some way look like them. And what Anthony does in this piece is meditate on that a little bit, both honoring it as a meaningful sentiment, but then also com complicating it, complexifying it, and asking if, if we can really understand better what it means by picking it apart and analyzing it in some detail in the manner of a, a philosopher. And if you want to hear the full story uh, of how this piece came about and all the other considerations that Anthony brings to bear in his popular writing as a philosopher, you can listen to the uh, podcast interview uh, that I did with him on Line Edit as well. So I'll talk, as I do in all these videos, about three editorial points, a kind of a big picture point a mid-sized point and a, a small point, something that could be as small as a, a sentence or a word change. In the case of this particular piece, unlike pretty much every other piece we've talked about in this uh, video series, there is really no, no big picture editorial intervention. If you look at the piece in the first draft and compare it with the, the editorial changes that we made en route to publication, you'll see that the basic structure of the piece was right. The opening of the piece was right, the closing of the piece was right, the pacing of the piece was right, the voice of the piece was right. It was a really great piece, and I, I think it would be misleading to suggest that there was a major big picture change. In fact, I believe it even came uh, to me with the, the headline, what does it mean to look like me, on the piece, which is also quite rare. Most pieces that are given titles in draft form often see those titles change at the hands of the editors by the time the uh, piece has been published. Anthony did a great job, and I think it would be misleading to say that there's a kind of a big picture edit that we need to focus on here. Uh, but I will, I will make a related point in the spirit of the big picture insight, which is that if you look through the draft, despite the fact that I would characterize this as a, a pretty perfect first draft, you'll still see that every single paragraph, say for the final paragraph, has some, some editorial intervention, usually a smattering of editorial interventions. And we'll talk about what some of those are, but I'd also like to stress that if I look through a piece like this, I'll see that I maybe cut an example or two or cut a sentence or two. And when I look at why those were done, sometimes it's just editorial discretion and on a different day or maybe in the hands of a different editor, you would have seen those uh, cuts remain or you would have seen different cuts made. And part of my point here is that there's just an issue of editorial discretion. Sometimes as an editor, you just have a sense of pacing that, or a sense of repetition or something like that, and you'll just make a cut. But it's a borderline case. Not everything is a, a hard and fast rule. So that's one point about editorial discretion. Another point is that I often will look at a back at an edit like this and I won't understand why I cut something and I'll later remember that it's because there was a simple reason to do it, such as the print space was a little smaller than we had been told or the art was a little bigger than we had been uh, expecting. And by the time the piece was getting ready to be published, we had to find a few sentences to drop. And so in, the, in those situations, if there's an example, or two examples where there could just be one, sometimes it's natural just to drop the, the extra example. So that's the big picture point here. No, nothing really wrong with the draft, but still plenty of editorial interventions and probably a fair amount of just pure editorial discretion. If there's a general lesson here for academics in particular, writing for a, a broader audience than they're accustomed to writing for, it's don't freak out when you see edits from an editor, especially if you haven't written for a newspaper or a magazine before. I conduct uh, these workshops that we've referred to in the uh, videos and in the podcasts where I'll meet over a course of two days with about a dozen academics. And 
it inevitably happens that someone will have turned in a draft that I characterize as you know, pretty perfect or, or great. And uh, when I pull it up on screen and it's covered in uh, red ink in every single paragraph, people are usually surprised. Certainly the author of the piece is usually surprised uh, thinking that if it's a piece is perfect, maybe there's going to be a little copy editing or a little formatting the piece so consistent with the house style of the publication or something like that, but that there won't be this much kind of messing around. But that's pretty common. Even really seasoned writers who work in this form very well will find a lot of adjustments, edits, queries throughout a piece. So that's a normal thing to experience. And it's probably something that most academics heading into this uh, should be aware of. The second edit I would like to talk about in this piece uh, is more of a mid-sized edit. Let me draw your attention to a passage in the piece about midway to two thirds of the way through the piece. When Anthony is talking about the fact that this notion of looking like me which sounds like a, it's all about resemblance and kind of identification, is often as much about aspiration than it is about a resemblance. So as much about looking, wanting to look like someone who looks different than you as, as much as it looks like someone who looks like you. It's an interesting irony that he's pointing out in the piece. Now, in the first version of this piece, he, he begins with this Tessa Thompson example, and then he uses this Lil Nas X example. And you'll notice in the piece, one of the few sort of semi-structural changes I made in this piece where, again, I made very few substantive interventions, I did switch this example, the order of the example, so that the Tessa Thompson example follows the Lil Nas X example. Now, why did I do that? Well, in this case, as you'll notice just looking at the piece, most of the explanation of this complicated concept that look like me as much as, as much about aspiration as it is about resemblance. Much of that explanation is done in the example of Lil Nas X and it's done in Anthony's voice. So if you walk through that whole paragraph, he's really talking you through this great example. In the original order that he gave these two points, you first get the point in Tessa Thompson's voice. She's explaining it in her own quotation and uh, Anthony drives it home a little bit, but the balance is half Tessa Thompson, half Anthony Appiah here in that example. And again, by leading with Lil Nas X, you really stay in Anthony's voice for the, the whole difficult part of this exposition where you're really introducing this concept. And then by the time we get to Tessa Thompson, you've, you've been fully explained this concept again in Anthony's voice, and you can get a little bit more in her voice and a little bit in his, and, and it's more just driving home the point and less introducing the point. Now, the general uh, takeaway here, I think for anyone writing these kind of pieces, but it's especially true for academics, is to lead with your own voice. Particularly academics have a tendency to want to introduce exposition or explanation in their pieces by quoting someone else at length. Sometimes it's because that person is more authoritative. Sometimes it's because that person simply, in the eyes of the academic, did a very good job of explaining it, and they like this particular quotation, or they like this particular passage. So the academic is tempted to just quote it, in part because in academic contexts, that's uh, a customary thing to do, both for reasons of authority and for reasons of kind of intertextuality, citation. There's a lot of reasons why academics might want to use quotations and to expect that the reader will patiently read through them and absorb new information in the quotations. In the journalistic context, I think the rule of thumb and the general principle to draw here is that the reader is entering the piece in your voice and they want to stay in your voice as much as possible. You want to use a quotation to drive home a point that you've introduced in your own voice. You don't want to use a quotation to introduce a new point. Now, again, in, in Anthony's case, this is not an extreme example. You, I, I, I could Go to other pieces I've edited where someone really relied heavily on someone else's voice to make a key point. In this instance, again, it's a bit subtler. It's more that the reason I switched the order of the points was that Anthony did a much better job with Lil Nas X explaining everything in his words. And in the Tessa Thompson case, it's a little compressed and it relies as much on her words as his words. The point here is that the Tessa Thompson example is really a secondary example that drives home the point. The Little Nas example is the complicated, really worked through example in Anthony's voice that really establishes the point. So again, use a quote to drive home your point. Don't lead uh, with someone else's voice. And uh, you'll actually see another instance of this same a principle at work much earlier on in the piece, right at the outset of the piece when Anthony is giving all of these uh, different examples 
of what he's talking about with the look like looks like me locution. He mentions Eva Ligoria. He mentions Terrell Alvin McGraney. He, he's got a bunch of examples here in the beginning. And I, I was for just pacing reasons, I thought, well, we got to let's try to get rid of one of these. I think there were maybe four examples and I thought maybe just three would be good. We joke in journalism all the time that three is a trend. So I find that's generally true. If you can give three examples, it suggests that there's more to come. Four is often more than you need in a short piece like this. Anyhow, so I'm looking at these instances that he gives, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out which one I'm going to cut. And again, the principle of lead with your own voice, a version of it seems to apply here too, because when I look at the one that I cut, uh, this, this example from uh, Jenny Han that he, that he cites, a lot of it is in her voice. It's the most quotey, as it were, of all the examples, the one with the longest kind of most spun out a quotation. And in that case, I tend to think, you know what, let's stay with the shorter ones. Let's stay with the ones where we're getting a, a brief little quote and we're staying with Anthony's voice as much as possible. The third and final editorial point uh, that I want to make is extremely small, but it's worth making because I think it speaks to the kind of general mindset that, that you should have as you approach this kind of writing as an academic, uh, writing for a, a larger audience. And, and that is, in a number of cases in the piece, Anthony alludes to a um, typically a pop culture artifact or a musician or filmmaker in a slightly knowing way. So for instance, from the very beginning of the piece, he alludes to a new TV series called David Makes Man, and he doesn't give you even a little gloss of what, it, what the show is about. So we did that. We had this little gloss that says, which follows the life of a black boy in a public housing project. Another simple example comes in the section that we were talking about before about Lil Nas X, where Anthony refers to the yeehaw agenda in the first draft. Now, by signaling it's so called, he helps you understand that it's maybe a term you haven't heard of before. He signals that he realizes you might not be familiar with it. But I propose just driving home the whole point and saying the yeehaw agenda and then defining it here in a little clause set off with M dashes, the yeehaw agenda, the trend of black cultural figures in rancher attire that fueled and was fueled by Little Nas's song. So throughout a piece like this, my instinct at a publication like the Times, where we have a huge readership and people coming from all different kinds of walks of uh, life, expecting different things and coming with different backgrounds, is in general explain everything except for the household names. Now, on the one hand, there are clear cases, right? If someone refers to Donald Trump, I'm not going to say who was recently the president of the United States. That's that's something where we're just going to, it's an obvious household name. There are going to be difficult cases that fall somewhere in, in, in the realm where you don't really know whether to, you need to identify them or not. In those cases, I say err on the side of identification. It's always easier for an editor to take it out. And quite frankly, as an editor who reads this piece, if I have to go hunting around to understand who uh, people are or what a TV show is about, I might be disinclined to keep reading it or to read it with as much attention. So it, it never hurts to, to identify as much as possible. It's worth pointing out that at the very end of this piece, we allude to the, the albums of Bruce Springsteen. And we don't identify him as a, an American musician or an American rock star or anything like that. It's clear that he's a musician of some sort because of the albums. So even here, he is sort of somewhat implicitly identified. But there's an interesting question. Why did we not identify Bruce Springsteen? And I didn't talk about this with Anthony, and I don't remember thinking about it at the time very much. But reflecting on it, it seems to me that uh, Bruce Springsteen has been a major American kind of cultural figure for five decades since the 70s. And so if there's a household name when it comes to American popular music, uh, he would be one of them. But keep in mind that this kind of thing is dynamic and always in flux. In 20 years in the New York Times, Bruce Springsteen might be someone we have to identify. There'll be plenty of readers who grew up without listening to him or without knowing who he was in the culture. And I'm sure there are people that, that we identify now in the Times that 30 years ago seemed as if they didn't w wouldn't merit a mention. There's no science to it. The general rule is try to explain who everybody is. If it's really obviously a household name or if it's someone that you think just pretty much everyone is going to know, you can get away without mentioning it. But in general, it's a good exercise to go through your piece and say, am I alluding to things here in a knowing way? Am I explaining something where it implicitly relies on understanding the plot of the show or something like that? That's the small point at the end. It is, as I said, a kind of small point on the page. It speaks to a bigger issue, which is when you're writing for a big audience, you want to constantly be imagining 
who are these people? They could be all kinds of different people. It could be an elderly uh, dentist. It could be a young a sound artist. It could be someone from an Anglophone country that's not the United States. It could be someone from a non-Anglophone country who happens to speak English and likes to read the Times online. The more you have a variety of different kinds of possible readers floating around in your head, the more work you'll do to just make sure you're always trying to explain things in the most accessible way. So uh, I would say that's the larger takeaway here of this point that uh, you explain everything but the household names is always do the kind of imaginative work of, of thinking of all the different possible people who could be reading your piece. Thanks again for joining us for Line Edit. We're very grateful to the John Templeton Foundation's public engagement team who made this project and its associated podcast possible. We're also grateful to professors Dave DeSteno and Lisa Feldman Barrett at Northeastern University, which administers our grant. And of course, we couldn't have done this without the generosity of Kwame Anthony Appiah, who graciously allowed us to look under the microscope at his first draft and the final product. This video was hosted and produced by me, James Ryerson, and produced and edited by Joseph Fridman. Happy writing. <laughs>